Fun. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest in an ongoing series of conversations around library advocacy sponsored by the California Library Association. Slide you're looking at is up there for one purpose only, and that's so that people watching this in the archive version on YouTube will get a little background on the program. So I'm going to give about 30 seconds for you all to look at this, which explains what we're doing, and then we're going to dive into it. This will be about the only 30 seconds of silence you get for the next 90 minutes. So here we go. Obviously, as you see down at the bottom of that, we have these programs once a month. We usually post these as far in advance as we can. Sometimes we're way on it, like we already have our June event publicized on the CLA site. Our May one, we're still firming up, so that I hope will go up in the next week or so. And the recordings, if you're watching the recording, you know how to get there. And finally, a pitch, if you like what you see here, we, are, we do have a bequest that is at the heart of this program, but we always want to make sure that we're refilling the coffers so if you like what you're seeing here, feel free to make a donation at that site that you see listed there. Uh, that helps us to show support for the program and also helps to make sure that we can keep doing this well into the future. And with that commercial out of the way, let's stop the share and let's get right down to it. Oh, hi, Sean. Good to see you here. So how did we get here today? Pretty simple. It's advocacy in action. A couple of years ago, Anthony Chow, who's one of our uh, co-presenters today, who heads the School of Information at San Jose State University, brought in some of his spectacular students from the university talking about projects they did that were advocacy projects as part of their learning. I sat in that audience listening, stunned at the beauty and the enthusiasm of what those students were accomplishing. And in my usually five-year-old way at the end of the whole session, ran up to the front and I said, that was spectacular. I'd like to have some of you involved in what we do through the Ursula Myers program. And they're all going, Ursula who? So we chatted and a long story made short, one of those people, Esra Noir, who is a, a librarian down at Claremont University and is already involved in advocacy at many levels and making quite a name for herself, she came to the first four Ursula Meyer online sessions. We were also happy and impressed with the level of expertise and the questions she asked as a participant that we invited her onto the committee that oversees this whole project. Since then, she has done a couple of Ursula Meyer's presentations with me. She and I work in a variety of other uh, contexts in advocacy and other things, making the point that you never know from the most simple act of advocacy or conversation where it's going to lead. This is how we build our partnerships. That really is at the heart of what we're doing today. As you hear from Sarah talking about her case study, you hear from Anthony about how the program came about, and more importantly, you interact with each other, say, how can we be doing more of this and spread the wealth? What I hope will come out of this is an, an extension and a further strengthening of what the whole Ursula Myers project brings you under the auspices of CLA. So with that said, let me just ask those of you who are on, it's good that we have a small intimate group here. Let's get to the heart of what we're gonna do today by just doing a, a kind of benchmarking. If you don't mind unmuting briefly, tell us what experience you have working with students in advocacy, either in libraries or any other setting. Let's just get that out on the table so Anthony and Sarah know the level of expertise we're already dealing with. Anybody? I have no experience. Yeah, you have no experience, our CLA president. <laughs> Not working with students in this capacity. So, Well, as CLA president, Sean, what do you see as some of the possibilities that we haven't explored yet? We've got two of the key players right here. I think that um, students can play a major role in in our profession. I mean, they're, they're entering into to our profession, but they're kind of in a place where they can still really be advocates in ways that like I cannot for my, you know, I have a sometimes conflict of interest. I can't, you know, I can't, during my job at least, I can't be an advocate in the same way that a student could be, if that makes sense. Wonderful, thank you so much. Anybody else? I'll turn on my camera, my super backlit camera, which is why I leave it off for a bit. Um, I, hi, I'm Sam. I'm a former iSchool student and uh, currently at CSU Dominguez Hills. Um, I don't really have much uh, direct student advocacy uh, workshop. I say I advocate adjacent <laughs> um, 
particular, the thing I can think of is we have something called uh, ASL, Affordable Learning Solutions, uh, which is a way for students to get textbooks for free or for cheap. And we have student assistants um, as part of that who actually go out to the classrooms to promote programs. Um, it's the closest thing I can think of other than when I table and give out stickers about how awesome the library is. <laughs> If you could walk away from the session with something in place as a result of talking with Sarah, Anthony, and everybody else, what would that look like to you? Uh, just kind of a little bit more of, um, so like I'm in reference right now, um, someone else is in charge of the uh, affordable learning solution. So she already has a great repertoire with her students, just kind of maybe seeing more opportunities uh, for other areas. Cause we have student assistants who probably are always looking to be able to step away from the desk where they sit behind to be able to do more. Wonderful. Thanks. All right, since it's such a small group, let me just move this along very quickly. Jerry, any uh, observation you have, anything you want to say about your experience or what you'd like to see come out of the conversation with the people we have today? Um, not anything specific. Uh, like I said, I'm just trying to just trying to learn. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's my first meeting. So I'm trying to soak in as much as I can. Hopefully, you know, make a few connections. Everybody seems great in the in the meeting. Uh, we hope to find that to be true and you come back many, many times. Tomas, I haven't been able to hear anything from you. Do you have audio capabilities? If not, you can use the chat or you can just sit back and we'll just have a good time here. Okay, if there's nothing there, then let's get to the heart of it. Anthony. Talk, please, a little bit about how this got started and the impact it's having out there. Sure. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having us today. We appreciate it. Um, so my uh, focus on advocacy began as a young uh, assistant professor um, where uh, we've had a lot of battles in North Carolina. So ultimately, I became the uh, chair of advocacy for uh, the North Carolina Library Association and uh, I'm looking at Jerry, for example, and what I learned is, you know, the Nike uh, slogan, just do it, uh, I think is largely uh, the best way to look at advocacy. So advocacy is overwhelming because you are talking to people both at the local and national level, and it can be very intimidating uh, because ultimately when we advocate, uh, the, there are so many um bills, et cetera, et cetera, sometimes it's very hard to get started. Um, and so as I grew and learned, uh, I realized very quickly um, this would be a, a wonderful learning opportunity for students. Uh, and so the thing about advocacy and hands-on learning is that I would say you're coloring uh, in the lines, um, oftentimes in education, but advocacy, <laughs> there are no lines uh, and uh, providing that opportunity, I think, was what I wanted to do for students. And so, uh, and the other selfishly is that as chair of advocacy, uh, we needed help. And, and so I think students really helped us with uh, creating flyers, uh, sending out emails, arranging for events, uh, getting out the word. Um, so case in point uh, is when uh, you send out a notice to all librarians in, in North Carolina, uh, you have to make sure the memo is well written, right? And you, so, and you need time for that. Uh, and time, of course, is the biggest issue. So ultimately, uh, that is how uh, it, it uh, got started in North Carolina at UNC Greensboro. And then I brought it here uh, uh, to uh, San Jose State. And the last thing I would say is, uh, is Students also bring a level of passion, expertise, and perspective that I think also really enhances uh, our advocacy resources. And I think uh, looking at Sean, for example, um, you know, we can help CLA and we can help library advocacy with students that want to learn and are willing to do, uh, you know, some of the more logistical work. And I think then that's a win-win for everybody. Uh, and that's kind of how I see uh, where this is going. So again, we really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and uh, Sarah is a perfect example of how by offering the opportunity, she received an email from me uh, and she volunteered, she's getting credit. And clearly she is, uh, what we're doing is resonating uh, with, with her and she's now taking a leadership role. So with that being said, uh, Paul, so thank Anthony, you. If there are people watching the archive version, 
and they want to get their library involved with you and with some of the students at San Jose State University, what are the simple steps they could take? Yeah, I think uh, probably two ways would be to, of course, continue collaborating with CLA. So I'm actually on the board as well. Um, but uh, we do have a student, uh, San Jose State student advocacy group. Uh, and so we're available on the web, obviously, uh, uh, on our, on the iSchool website as well. You can find that group. And uh, the, the bad thing and the great thing and the bad thing about uh, our students is that they graduate on us. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, Sarah's going to graduate some sometime soon, I'm sure. Uh, and so we'll have another leader or set of leaders in her place within a year. But that's just fine. And that's the way it's designed. So it sounds good. Anything that you're really looking to do to establish uh, better relations with our colleagues throughout the state of California at this point? Well, you know, um, I'm a big believer in you have to have resources to do things well and do things in a sustainable uh, nature. And so I think uh, my job is to create that resource for Sean and others. Uh, and we're standing ready to help the cause when we're asked to. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think part, part of my job is to continue, and the students have helped me uh, continue to uh, improve the curriculum and the experience and, and how we're organized. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I think, I think for us, the message to everyone out there is we are ready to go. Let us know how we can help. Uh, and then on top of that, of course, as you ask us for help, it's serving as a wonderful educational opportunity for our students. And, and uh, it, ma it makes it easy for me as the instructor of record to give them exciting projects because they love it. They're learning a lot. And it makes me, uh, it makes me lo look good as an instructor when, in fact, it's just pairing them uh, together with uh, cool projects. So. Wonderful. For those watching the archive version, I did put into the chat that I don't know if you can see or not links to what's going on at SJSU. If you want to get to the School of Information site, uh, it's basically iSchool.SJSU.edu. You'll find it there some links to their library advocacy projects, uh, to their, let's see, there's an information about their podcast series. And actually, yeah, Anthony, what can you talk about the podcast series just briefly here? Uh, the pod, uh, which, which podcast series? The, the one that's... Uh... I, there's an advocacy podcast series that I saw on the oh, site there. Right. Yeah, we uh we 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 started it and then stopped it. Uh I had uh wanted to partner with ALA, uh, but that just never got off the ground. So um we are looking for a partner, hint hint, Paul, uh to 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 do that. Um obviously the new podcast that you're working on, Information Gone Wild, is also similar. Uh, but I would love to still focus in on on advocacy. Uh, I think what we need is help getting uh, presenters uh, to the table uh, and then we will, we'll do the rest. So, but yeah, the intent was to, to be uh, again, a leader in advocacy uh, in, in, in sharing best practices from advocates all across the country. So. All right. So there's an invitation to all of you, both on the live session here and watching the archive version, you got speakers you want to see contact Anthony, let them know that they're out there. You want to be part of that. Let them know you're out there. You want to be part of this? Maybe Anthony and I are going to be having a conversation after this about yet another series. The one he alluded to is something that uh, Maurice Coleman, Esra Noir, and I are doing. We just started this. The first episode is about to go live on uh, YouTube. That's an interview with Dave Lankies. Second one is, I think, in post-production at this point. And that was with Patty Wong. And we're setting up something right now with the incoming president of the American Library Association, so lots going on out there, and we need to hear from you to make sure that we're reaching you. All that said, let us get to the heart of this. Sarah, you've got some wonderful experience, some case studies to talk about, and some tips to offer. Let's turn it over to you and see where we go. Brilliant. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Share your screen. There we go. All right. Is everybody able to see it? I'm getting it fine. Yeah. That's great. You. Brilliant. This was a presentation I put together uh, about library advocacy. It includes two major parts. And I went ahead and created like an overview so we can get a glimpse of what we're going to be talking about. Um, the two major parts is one of the things we ended up doing this semester is 
summarize library standards. We have a document given to us by the California Public Library System, um, and we wanted to make that as digestible as possible. So I will be briefly overviewing what those library standards are, um, getting a glimpse of kind of why we do what we do, and then getting into actual case advocacy that we have accomplished this semester and looking at projects we've worked on, um, art that we've made and kind of the results looking at it from uh, the last few months. Uh, getting into who are we? Uh, my name is Sarah Schnetker, uh, pronoun she, her. I used to go to UC San Diego uh, where I got my bachelor's degree and now I'm at SGSU getting my master's in library and information science. Um, I used to do campus tours at UC San Diego, and I used to give that fun fact that kept people engaged of like who I am um, and kind of prove I'm not a robot. And that fun fact will mean something to you if you play video games. It will mean nothing if you don't. Uh, I've completed the Pokédex on four separate occasions. I'm particularly proud of that. Uh, to those who don't know what Pokémon is, I like to collect things. And I think that's the best way to explain it. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Chow if he wants to introduce or add anything about him. Great, yes. Uh, I think uh, Paul did a great job, uh, but again, I'm Anthony Chow, the director of the School of Information at San Jose State. And I think, uh, again, why I'm so committed to this is because uh, the opportunities that we're providing our students really reflects how I learned as well. And so I think Jerry probably and others are here to learn more about advocacy and really the key is to just get in there and do it. Um, and I can say, and I think as Sarah sees uh, as well, when I first got involved is because there was a need. And uh, instead of looking around to see who else was gonna step forward, I stepped forward and realized that it wasn't that hard. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the end, you just gotta, gotta get it done. And, uh, and, and I'm just delighted to be able to work with, uh, you know, students like Sarah, so. And we're both here from SGSU School of Information. Uh, I am taking these classes completely remote and asynchronous. Um, I have the benefit of being a part of an online program. So I'm able to work. Uh, I actually work and live in Los Angeles County. So I'm able to do all of my classes online and do this in tandem with my work. And that makes it very flexible for me. Uh, I think I'm supposed to say that I'm not here on behalf of San Jose State University. Uh, I am a student at San Jose University, um, and I just wanted to make sure we had that clarifier. Uh <laughs> and Sarah, uh, before you continue, it's something that Sean said, and, and for all the listeners, uh, there, there is, students do present a, uh, to be candid, a loophole, right, which is that ultimately we, as the representatives of our respective institutions, we oftentimes cannot take a stance, should not take a stance. Uh, however, students, especially when they're earning credit and it's an educational, can take a stance. And so I think uh, that's another very important point um, in terms of moving things forward uh, and kind of working together. And what I think is really nice about that relationship is that by taking it for credit, we have the opportunity to get the resources from a university, but still just be a student and be able to do things a bit more independently. And I kind of like that tandem work, I think works really well. So I wanted to open it up to our four participants uh, and get an idea of who are you and where are you from? I will stop sharing so we can have that conversation. I well, I think, I'm yeah, sorry. go ahead, Sean. I'm Sean Thrasher. I'm the director of Ontario City Library, and I'm also the current president of California Library Association. Um, hi, my name is Jerry Hidon. Um, I work at the Ontario City Library under Sean, and I'm also uh, in uh, high school for my MLIS. I just started the program in January. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. To, I was like, Jerry, careful, your boss is behind you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's down the hall. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam Warner. As I mentioned earlier, um, I graduated from the iSchool in December 22. I can't believe it's been that long already. Um, but I am currently what's called a Rios librarian at Cal State Dominguez Hills, which is reference uh, instruction and outreach services. So. I know. 
I don't yeah. know if Tomas's audio ever ended up coming through. Yeah, I haven't heard anything so far. Tomas, you can put it in chat if you care to, and if not, we'll just keep moving right on. And and Sarah, before we continue, um, I'd like to ask Sean uh, his thoughts on advocacy in terms of kind of your as you move throughout your career. Do you have any thoughts on you know kind of how, how you evolved as a, as an advocate to where you are now in terms of easy well, I hard? Mm -hmm. I don't think I would be the president of CLA if I didn't know that advocating for libraries and librarians was important. I mean, I, it's been I feel like part of my entire career um when i started out you know as a little baby librarian long ago i was involved in ala back then as a teen librarian and then a children's librarian and then I, once i moved to california i switched to cla professionally because i thought it was more useful for my own career because it was more local but also because i really care about our libraries so that that's kind of been my trajectory uh, through advocacy but I've also seen it in action as well. Like uh, a library was at built a brand new building and they had to get a bond to do that. And so that took advocacy in the community and quickly found out what I can and can't do as a, a, a librarian while I'm at work. Like I can't actually advocate for things like that. It has to all be off, off of work. So I know how powerful advocacy can be. And in this time too, more than any other, I think librarians need help. Um, we're under attack all the time right now, and we definitely need support out there, you know, that can come to our defense. So that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, that's a great point, Sean. And I think what's so important about what Sean just said is, is that advocacy is also kind of marketing the field in a way too, because uh, the, the sense that decision makers uh, sometimes don't understand libraries is a very real fact. <laughs> Uh, oftentimes because uh, the demographic and social economic status of our leaders tends to be in a situation where they may not necessarily be using libraries at that time. Now, of course, they use libraries as children. They use libraries to get through school. But in their particular business life, they're not using libraries. And so what Sean said is so important because ultimately, uh, obviously, your decision makers understanding the value of libraries as opposed to not hearing from their local library and having that stereotype in their head. Uh, well, I don't use libraries. So do, does anyone else need to use libraries is a huge uh, issue. Uh, and again, a huge reason why it's so important uh, because obviously they're the ones deciding on your budgets. And by the way, I'm not sure in California, Sean, but I know in North Carolina, 90, 90 plus percent of all funding came from the local resources. And so obviously those relationships and also understanding what the priorities of your decision makers are and how libraries can help with that is so important. So, Yes, almost all, uh, all, almost all of our funding comes from our general fund. I mean, we get some grants that fund special things, but you know, all of our general services are local funding. That's, that's wonderful. City, not even like a county or anything, like from the city libraries. So. That's wonderful. And I last thing I'll say, and I'll turn it back over to Sarah, is that that's a perfect example of good relationship building as well, in terms of, uh, and it works for grant funding as well. Um, the same thing at the federal and local level. Um, we want to pay respects to our decision makers or the funders to understand what's important to them. Uh, and then to, to, again, align our efforts to that. It's a very simple relationship, actually. But uh, imagine if you were a decision maker and we never heard from Jerry, and then Jerry comes to us asking for money. Um, you know that that becomes a bigger issue if we've never if we don't know who you are uh, and we've never had a conversation with you, and whatever you're asking for may not be aligned with our priorities, right? So, yeah. Excuse me. This is Tom Scudder. Can you uh, hear me now? Yes. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Yeah, I got smart and finally went on the phone instead of trying to make myself heard over nothing. Um, yeah, I'm part of um, the newly revitalized Friends of the Ontario City Library. Seems like we're well represented in this little group now. Um, and I was thinking that I would be pretty much a fly on the wall here, just mainly listening and learning and then transmitting all of that back to the uh, larger group of the friends. 
uh, I have actually have an MLA as well from the late great um, Fullerton Library School. However, I spent most of my life as an economist after that. Um, and I'm sort of trying to figure out sort of next steps for our group. We support the library mainly uh, financially, I think, in a fairly small way. I kind of, that's a personal opinion of mine. And I'd really like to uh, find where we can go next in actually expanding our, um, our support of the library. I'm not really certain how that would work with uh, students, but I'm open to learning, and that's why I'm here. You may not hear much from me on the rest of this uh, rest of this recording. Certainly, uh, with Sean on it, uh, he knows much better than I than what's going on in Ontario, and obviously in California as, as a whole. So I'm going to kind of step back, and I'll jump in if there's anything of of interest, anything that I'd like to add, and otherwise I'll just leave it all back to you again. Uh, I, pre I appreciate it. it's good hearing from you, Thomas. And I, I would like to say uh, real quickly that uh, the way we can help is students, again, can support initiatives that you may have, uh, whether it be sending emails out, um, helping you put, the, put together a flyer or an infographic or uh, something like that. And how you all can help, I believe. So I, I have several book chapters coming out. One is uh, Library 2035. Uh, so one of the the really popular words right now is asset-based, kind of focusing on uh, assets as opposed to deficits. And so in my opinion, and I know Sean is uh, as, as well as seeing, one of the privileges of being in my role is I get to see all of these extremely impressive um, modern uh, model libraries. And so in my opinion, uh, I, I would say work with Sean to continue painting what 2035 looks like, right? And and pay and and go look at examples because when you step into a model library, Thomas, you get goosebumps. It is just amazing, right? And so I I, I haven't been to Sean's library, but the bottom line is there are examples, and I'm sure yours is too, of what the future could look like. And I think you want to paint those uh, paint that vision uh, for your decision makers. Yeah, for those of you well, watching the version here, there's a really important point to be made, which is doing these sections to help bring people together. And already we're just seeing in the first few minutes of this how one person saying, I'm doing this and I'm trying to gain more about that gets the open response that you're hearing from people like Anthony and from Sarah. So I hope that as you're listening or watching this uh, long after it's been posted out there on YouTube, that you don't think, oh, that didn't apply to me because we do want you as part of the gang. You've got Anthony, you've got Sarah, you've got Sean. You have the CLA Legislation and Advocacy Committee, and you've got the Ursula Meyer Committee. So you want to get involved. It's up to you to let us know you're there, and we will grab you and run with you as fast as we can. Sarah, back to you. All right. I will go back to sharing my screen. There we go. Um. Yeah, just kind of springboarding off of those points, I wanted to talk a little bit of what student advocacy has meant to me as a student and how uh, getting motivated in the program and those kind of like, I call them columns of that motivation for myself. Um, when I connected with Anthony Chow for the first time and was going into a lot of those meetings, I knew I needed more information. I needed to know more about advocacy. And I actually attended one of these sessions in order to get that information uh, well ahead of time. So the step one is always learning, learning about what advocacy is, what programs are out there to help me learn, um, what are the actual legislation that are impacting me, um, the constant flow of information online and learning about the issues is always step one and it's part of that motivation process. Step two um, is speaking about those things, making noise, talking about the issues, getting involved with the issues. When people say get involved, they mean make noise. They mean talking to your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues, your fellow students. 
um, whatever capacity that is, be it online when you're doing it through Instagram or making posts or just bringing it up sometimes with your friends in a casual setting. Um, as long as that conversa conversation keeps moving, then the action item will keep moving. Um, so kind of making noise is what's going to trigger that third column, which is inspiration. And I hope that relationship for all three is pretty cyclical. Um, by inspiring other people, they're going to be learning more things. By learning, they're going to be speaking and inspiring themselves. And so that relationship of how they get tied together uh, to form what student advocacy is. And I wanted to open it up again for what advocacy means to you and if you have students working under you what that relationship looks like. Not sure if anyone has any strong thoughts. If not, I will. Well, I'm a sucker for an easy question. Advocacy to me is getting out there and, and working <laughs> to build a constituency for positive change in the communities we serve. I think that, that sets us aside from political conversations about am I only speaking for the left? Am I speaking for the right? Am I speaking for the right. moderate or whatever? It's like whatever point you are at on the political spectrum, mm -hmm. you get out there and you talk with colleagues and make your case and you listen to the other side. You seek those points of collaboration, those points of intersection. And working at that level, we get past some of the things we've been seeing where people say, oh, we can't do anything, which I don't think is true at all. Yeah, and kind of building on that, politics in general is a very tense and touchy topic. A lot of people don't like to talk about politics. We're going into a presidential election. There's a lot of tension that goes into a presidential year, right? But when it comes to speaking about a topic, I would argue you're not talking for red or blue or Democrat, Republican. You're speaking for yourself and your ideals. You're trying to connect with other people who are of like minds and so speaking on these topics it, there is a lot of politics to it especially since it relates to legislation but being personal about it drawing attention to that uh, uh, indiv individualistic idea that this is impacting me and this is impacting my community because libraries are inherently community centered you know, we had a session last month with three people from the Monrovia Public Library, and they talked about the center they have that serves veterans. We explored that as an act of advocacy. It has nothing to do with where you stand on a political spectrum. Stands, it addresses directly the idea of members of a community saying, our vets are important to us. They are part of our community. We're going to work together to make sure that those needs are met. That, to me, is the heart of advocacy at its best levels. Yeah, and I also wanted to mention that one of the other great things about working with Sarah and the students is um, they greatly enhance our communication. Um, in, in other words, the people that we need to talk to and bring together are all very busy. Uh, and so uh, I think without the students' help in terms of uh, helping us arrange and coordinate these discussions, uh, oftentimes these discussions aren't had at all. Uh, because we're uh, whether I'm not responding to email or they're not responding to email, bottom line is we never talk. Uh, and again, students have really uh, been able to do that. Case in point, advocacy work that we're doing for CSLA, advocacy work, advocacy work that we're doing with ALA. Uh, those, uh, and then also some other things that are happening behind the scenes. The students have really been instrumental in again, kind of uh, operating in those gray areas. Uh, where we don't typically have the time. And so that's super powerful uh, because so much is getting done because we have that assistance from them. And I think also Sarah and others see that uh, advocacy is definitely for the persistent, right? It just doesn't happen. You've got to stay on it, stay on it, stay on it uh, until you get it done. So I wanted to talk a little bit about friends in the library as well, because that's our local advocates at every single public library, at least in many other libraries do, and that students can really play a role in friends that's both valuable to the friends and to their own professional career as well. So prior to the pandemic, our friends board had a couple of library school students on the board and they were given leadership roles on the board and how important it is to develop those. That's a really safe place 
to develop those leadership roles, to be president or secretary or treasurer. And that, that later on in your career, you can use that on your resume and in your interviews. So yeah, I did this at a library, but also you're also helping your local library too. So I think the friends needs to always be thrown out there as that's that's like down, you know, down on the ground advocacy in your own community. Sean, I is a great idea. So let me, we can talk offline about ways in which we can plug that into this experience. Um, you know, friends groups now, they're always looking for younger members mm -hmm. because it's mostly retirees at the end of the day, but they want new blood all the time. And students come in knowing about libraries, enthusiastic and passionate. I just don't think that they know they can do that. So yeah, I would love to talk more about it. Yeah, Sean, um, as you said that one project that we haven't gotten off the ground and it's all Sarah's fault. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> it is to create a GIS map for uh, public libraries in California. There is already one um, uh, 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 sponsored by the state library, but we want to take that and soup it up. Uh, in other words, we want to add uh, legislative districts to it. And Sean, I think it would be perfect to add friends of the libraries to oh, that yeah. as well. Because again, I think part of our role, Paul, is to serve as a nexus, right? Our job is to serve as a communication relationship building uh, uh, entity. And, and so, yeah, let's talk offline about that, Sean. I do have the money for it. I've allocated it. We just have to get it off the ground. In fact, what we've been asking for Greg is just to get the GIS map data from him. Because uh, I don't know if any, any of you are familiar with GIS mapping, but what's great about GIS mapping is that once you do a GIS map, you get access to all the U.S. Census layers as well, right? And so you can really uh, have a very accurate demographic map that then anybody can use for free to kind of find their friends of the library, Sean, in, in their local area. So I think that's a fantastic idea. And again, Sarah, when we see that in the in the task list, maybe over the summer, you'll know where it germinated from. Uh, because again, that's where students help, Sean. Um, they can keep the contact information up to date, right? They can they can work with the consultant to then uh, refresh the GIS map, things like that that we otherwise wouldn't have the time and money to do, right? So great, yeah, Paul, you're you're building relationships here, so definitely. Well, let's do one more, Sean and Anthony. If you do pr proceed with that, uh, look up Jerry Deer, D E A R, who used to I think he's still the San Francisco Public Library. I'm, I haven't seen him in quite a while. But Jerry was doing unbelievable things about 10 years ago, very visionary with big data projects. He showed me a dream project, which would do exactly what you're talking about, set some maps up. You could filter for specific things in the community to see who was where and what needs they had. And I don't know that it very, went very far at that point, but Jerry was just wonderful. And if, if he's still out there and is willing to work with us, we're building that very relationship you just talked about, Anthony. Well, that's fantastic, Paul. Again, that's what's great about GIS mapping is that the GIS developers, they have access to that existing data already, and it's all just visualization at that point. So, Sarah, would you like to take back your presentation? <laughs> I'd love to take back my presentation. <laughs> all right. Uh, I wanted to briefly talk about why we do student advocacy. Um, I'm sure those of you who work in libraries are already familiar with this information. You obviously want to keep your job. Uh, it's always very nice to have that. But I also wanted to talk a bit about why student libraries specifically, or, or public school libraries, because I'm going to be talking a little bit about that data in a moment. Um, California public school libraries serve over 6 million students uh, across 10,000 campuses. That includes elementary school, middle school, high school. Um, and the importance of addressing that is that a lot of these communities, a lot of these public schools are, are underserved or don't even have library services. And a lot of that links back to funding. So we're going to uh, take a moment to explore that relationship real quick um, by looking at some library standards. We pulled this information from this fun document called the Model School Library Standards for California Public Schools. Uh, it has information across all of the grades. What's really interesting about the document, besides this, the fact that it's kind of boring and overwhelming and very technical, is that they've broken up the different uh, uh, models and expectations for grade levels K through 12, but they lump all of high school together. All of high school's expectations are all lumped together. 
Um, I think part of this is because the science and studies that are referenced in this document are from pre-2010. Uh, there are some mentions of social media and chat rooms, but it really needs to be updated. That being said, it is still a good model for how libraries can improve upon. Um, it provides structure and goals for public schools to adhere to in order to best serve their students. Um, I wanted to briefly go into some of that data. So according to that document, which I'm just going to briefly summarize for you, there needs to be one full-time credentialed library librarian per 785 students. They are supported by para paraprofessional staff with the availability of 34 hours each week. Uh, there's an expectation that the facilities of a library could accommodate at least one class size and have a online access and web page. The uh, responsibilities of a public school librarian is to collaborate with teachers, manage collections, provide instructions, develop library plans and policies, and offer and provide reading guidance. And another part of the goals is to facilitate growth. There are, should be 28 books per student with the intent to grow one to two books per student per year and nothing over 15 years old. Now, those of you who are working in libraries, I'm sure have some contradictory experience with that. I'd like to uh, open that up one more time to get an idea of what is your experience uh, as a public librarian, as a public school librarian, wherever you may be, what is that experience adhering to these kind of guidelines and standards? Is this for uh, all public schools? This is for the California standards. So this is yeah. what the California Department of Education had passed back in 2010. I don't, I mean, Anne, maybe you could speak to it even more than I can, but I don't think anybody but our high schools have that standard in, on, in our local school districts. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So actually, um, at my children's school, um, which is down the street, um, I just, oh, by the way, I introduced myself in the chat, in the, the chat chat, but, um, during the pandemic, they actually got rid of the library and the principal at the time, like literally wiped it out and used it for storage. And we're in the middle of rebuilding it at the moment. And one of the fundraisers that I did through the school was the readathon and we're allocating some of that money to rebuild the library. But, um, the, I de the yeah that we definitely are yeah we have a huge lack of materials for the children right now and the library is so small so um yeah it's very it's I, those standards that that I don't think our principal is even aware of those right. <laughs> so um I would love to get a copy of that and actually show it to him so yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. I, I'm personally not a parent, but I'm friends with a lot of parents who have students in like elementary school, middle school, high school, and they talk about their experiences dealing with resources available. And it comes back to the library simply isn't open or the people who work at the libraries are not credentialed librarians and the books that they want to have aren't always available. And I think that experience really speaks to why we do what we do and why we have advocacy programs like this. Um, I'm actually going to share my screen once again to show you the contradictory data. Um, this is kind of the, the downside is what actually happens. Now, again, this data is looking specifically at California. Uh, only 9% of libraries in the state of California have credentialed librarians. They are open for 24 hours weekly with only 50% of libraries offering services during lunch, breaks, and evenings. That means that a majority of libraries are only available and open during school hours. 16% of public schools do not have designated spaces for libraries. Uh, California continues to rank nationally at the bottom. We are, uh, uh, according to the data, the worst public school library uh, system in the United States. Collaboration with teachers have hurdles like funding and curriculum disputes. Uh, I'm sure we've been seeing a lot of that in the news as well as 
the bands are starting to become more popular and have been on the rise. Uh, and another hurdle is funding has been localized in the state of California since 2013. Um, there's an interesting conversation to be had that although we can put aside uh, other factors like parent education, poverty, ethnicity, and percentage of English language learners within a certain community, it does directly impact the amount of funding they receive just based on how tax collections work, how the demand of those services worked. Um, and it's really interesting seeing kind of that contradict what libraries in California want to achieve. Uh, another important note is collection growth has gone stagnant with about 20 new books per school added each year. And over 20% of those books are over 20 years old. So the growth that California libraries want to adhere to are not being achieved. And these again are all statistics from the Department of Education, all available online. So this raises the question of how do we initiate change? And the short answer, money. <laughs> um, it always comes back to money. Everything ends up being about money. It's about how taxes are collected. Um, and this is, again, why we're doing the advocacy that we're doing. I'd like to pause for any questions, um, but I can also go right into my examples if we want to start on that. Sure, I'm going to add in something to the chat because I'm assuming you can't see it. Jessica added the following comments and um, she's not able to use her audio. She says, I established a friends group for our school libraries when we returned from the pandemic. It's made an amazing difference. I took our library from woefully outdated to a plan for turnover every 15 years and have the age of the collection up to date, though we're only at about seven books per student. So lots of growth to do. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's really interesting to seeing kind of post pandemic and during pandemic how changes like that have happened. Um, you know, a lot of people had a sudden intake in time and were able to be in more involved with their libraries. I know here in LA County libraries have been a very uh, uh, impactful and resourceful uh, option to receive COVID testing, to get masks, to re-engage communities and provide hotspots and internet, creating spaces for people to work from home. Um, it's really interesting seeing those specific programs actually continue past that point and how a lot of that is due to demand and how people are getting more involved with libraries to keep them going. Any other major comments? Hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and get into my case study examples. So let's get into it. Um, the first one that we have is AB 1078. This is a past project that the advocacy group has worked on with the disclaimer that I unfortunately did not get to work on this one. However, it may come back up again in the election season for this year. Um, this was signed into law by Gov Governor Newsom in September of 2023 last year, and this book, this bill would effectively limit book bans in the state by giving overall power to superintendents. And the goal is to protect diverse books, books that are being challenged, uh, books that teachers want in curriculum and that they've been forcibly removed or protested. Um, our past efforts spreading awareness in October has helped pass this measure. I'm moving into a project that I actually did get to work on. This was SB 1583 in Oregon regarding diverse books. Now, this is a uh, art piece or a um, advertisement piece that we had created uh, to spread information about what this was. Um, the bill prohibits discrimination when selecting textbooks, instruction material, uh, program materials or library books that are used in public school of this state. Uh, what we wanted to do was create a one, two, three step-by-step -step plan of what can the individual who saw this do to promote this bill. Um, a lot of the conversation around this bill at the time was there was a test a testify um, live public forum where individuals could show up and talk about what was important to them, but they also could write in. And I'll be going through some of those examples later. Uh, 
when making pieces, this one is designed specifically for Instagram. When making pieces like this, you have to make a point to be concise and accurate. You have to think, what would I want to know? You have to be simple and bright. The steps are clearly laid out. People love steps. They love going, check, check, check. I did those things. Um, it's Instagram friendly. It's cut to fit on Instagram. It's a square. And the use of tiny URLs. I had the added benefit for this particular project that these tiny URLs already existed. I didn't even have to create them. They already were available. But creating them is super easy. You just have tinyurl.com. You put in the really long URL you want people to direct to. And you create like a catchy phrase that people can remember and go to. Um, this is a interesting process because the hearing was held back in March, in the beginning of March. Um, the results were super interesting. There were 260 individuals who had opposed this bill. However, a large percentage simply wrote no or walked up to the mic and just said no. 112 support and at least two of them had identified themselves as SGSU students. Um, it passed committee hearing, and I'll be going again into some of those examples of what people have written and said, because uh, what you say in these situations really matter. Now, Sean, I do see a hand raised. Do you have something to add? Yeah, I was, a good, I was actually going to ask you a question about the Instagram ad that you posted before. Mm -hmm. So we know now that Instagram and Facebook have algorithms that aren't necessarily going to put this to the top. Do you have any tricks on how to get this into people's uh you know feed it's a really good question from my experience it's choice of words um the usually generally speaking the algorithm is designed to catch specific fonts and specific words it can read uh, uh times new roman very easily it can read a lot of those firmer fonts very easily when you use something like this with brush stroke or with a bit more bubbly characters then the algorithm's not as quick at picking them out. Or maybe it's reading it wrong and it's not filtering. So you want to choose words that uh, are, you don't want to use like book ban because that's very loud. That's one of the things they're probably filtering for. But if you talk more positively, we're protecting diversity, then we tend to get past those filters. Um, the only downside, I want to put emphasis on this fact, is that the only downside with using bubbly letters like this is that you are losing people who have reading impediments. Um, people who are dyslexic prefer strict, firmer fonts or with better characteristics that they can read. Um, so we are losing people that way. But you are also losing people by adhering to the filtering system. So you have to kind of choose your battles in that particular case. Sean, I'll add a couple of things here based on the experience I've had in social media and talking to people who use it and understand the algorithms. It seems that the more you can get people to repost your stuff, the more it puts those into other people's feeds in your own audience. If you can also get people to simply react to them with a, a like, that draws attention to it. And it does seem to increase the spread of me messages off your own account, as well as those who forward it for it you. It really depends on the social media platform. So in the case of Instagram, liking and saving the image is considered far better than commenting. But in Facebook, it facilitates commenting. It wants people to engage with one another. So it really depends on how the algorithm is set up. Like for TikTok, if you wanted to get more involved with TikTok, um, it's about duetting. It's about snipping it. It's about projecting the video behind you and reacting to it. It's about creating content that people interact with. And the algorithm's like, wow, people like talking about that. And so it shares it more. So learning the algorithms and how they differ between different social medias is really important. How about hashtags? Hashtags, I feel like is more of a Twitter thing. Instagram does have it. The downside with Instagram. So hashtags are kind of, they're not old, but they're definitely on the older side. I think they're on their way out because although they get used, when it comes to Instagram specifically, it's how you... Uh, follow specific tags. It's more likely to give you content for people you follow than give you new content. So it's hard to get on people's feeds. Whereas TikTok, it's looking for buzzwords. It's looking for the one uh, viral tag that everybody's using. And it's not necessarily as niche as Twitter, where those tags tend to go viral because they're funny. 
right? Or people are engaging with those tags because of how they adhere to that platform. And this was something I was going to touch on later, but you can't use the same image on these different platforms. They all filter very differently. They all go viral very differently. And so you have to adhere to what those social media platforms like and kind of work with it. I would also like to add to Sean that it, you can flip it around and uh, the logarithm of course is going to deliver content that you more frequently um, view as well. And so I think part of the ROI and making sure that we have robust uh, social media is that you want to build your network so that when you have something to say, you know, it will be viewed. Right. And so I do think that uh, certainly for CLA and also the iSchool, uh, it is a very high return on investment if you have a very active um, social media. Keeping in mind the 80-20 rule, which is basically 80% should be fun, entertaining, and just, you know, uh, interesting. Uh, and that 20% is actually little meaty content because, of course, the research has found if it's too weighty all the time, people are just going to ignore it because that's not what we're in the, in the social media for. Uh, we're in it for mostly for edumacation and entertainment. Uh, and uh, and so Sarah is, again, another example of the talent that she brings and the students, because, again, their ability to use Canva and other things, beautiful. And also it takes time, right? Time that most of us are not going to have. So. All right. Yes, I use Canva. I like Canva. Canva is very user friendly in the sense that it creates templates and you can just fill in information. So if I wanted a template with books or libraries, it's very good at having a ton of options for free. And I find that very beneficial. There are other tools. Um, I sometimes use Google Drive and just create like an image. Or if I want to make a meme, I can pull a meme image and add in the texts. Um, I think Dr. Chow did touch on the fact that activity is really important. The moment your account goes stagnant, you're falling off people's feeds. It's not filtering people in. I remember when TikTok was first starting to get big, the rule was you should be posting three videos a day because one of those videos a week might go viral. And that has changed a lot based on how saturated those social media platforms are, but it is important to identify those things. What is keeping my account active? And for Instagram, that's stories. What you post is not nearly as important as what you're putting on your daily story. And you are more likely to get engagement if you are interacting with those stories. I'm not on Twitter. I don't know all the, the, the tidbits for Twitter, um, but I do know it's short form. It's being simple, it's being quick and easy. And a lot of the funnier snippets are going in there. And so um, kind of identifying what is the social media platform used for and re re reaching the audience where they are. Any other questions? Sean raised his hand again. Yeah, I had another question for you about Twitter. So uh, I, like CLA is not using Twitter anymore because it just seems so poisonous. Uh -huh. What are your opinions of Twitter? And then what are your opinions of threads? Interesting. I personally had just never gotten into Twitter. It's not yeah. about Twitter, the platform. I just never got into it. None of my friends were on it. Um, short form, like I'm, I'm a chatty person. <laughs> you want to put me on a short form website? I know that culture has changed a lot, especially as it's transitioned to X. Um, and the leadership has changed. I know that that has been impactful. That being said, people have been trying to connect with who read books, who are trying to get off of Goodreads and trying to get more traction or have a YouTube channel and just want to kind of quote a line from their books. Those people are on Twitter and those people are engaging constantly talking about the books they're talking about. So I think it's a good way to not necessarily engage other people because it's going to be really hard fighting that audience but it is a good way to collect data and to get that information in return, know what people are talking about. And Sean, I, I would say, uh, unfortunately, to, to remain active on Twitter because, or X, uh, because politicians are still all in. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times we've done advocacy, like at the state and national level, where you set, you take a picture, you put it on Twitter, you tag that particular legislator, and within minutes, uh, they're liking it or reposting it. So I think in terms of the story and the uh, impact, 
I think it's a, a still a good idea to stick with X until we figure out whether the politicians are going to start. Because I think, honestly, Sean, it's the politicians. If the decision makers are still using it, we should still connect with them because the way the magic of, of social media is that we connect with them and they post anything about CLA or, or us, we're getting to their constituents, right? And that's that's really what we're after. So well, a third respect to this, Sean, and that is that for a while there, I was on Twitter an awful lot. I went into it kicking and screaming over a decade ago, didn't see didn't see the value of it. And then it became a very valuable tool in training, teaching, learning for the longest time. When the switchover came with the new owner and a lot of people started bailing, I found that the people I want to communicate with were on other channels. But more importantly, I saw a very interesting thing. All of us spent about three months saying, where do we go next? We need another meeting place. And it became clear after a couple of months, we really didn't need another meeting place. That particular platform for us had lost its effectiveness. We'd already found ways to be in touch. Some of the things like Signal and WhatsApp and sharing things like that. And we found at conferences where we used to use Twitter an awful lot to stay in touch. The conferences got better about actually having back channel modes. So bottom line for me is we always want to ask ourselves a primary question, where is our audience? Mm -hmm. And is our prospective audience in that platform that at this point we're not so crazy about? And if our prospective and current audience is still there, we need to have a presence. But understand it can change overnight as was the case with Twitter to X. And it could change back. I, I still maintain one account there just so that if it switches back, I've got my username there, but I haven't used it in over a year. Yeah, and kind of building off of that point and touching a little bit on threads, I know that threads kind of grew because of Twitter's downfall. A lot of people were leaving Twitter and trying to find somewhere to go. And so they went to threads and they tried to create threads and they tried to create on Instagram the same thing that existed on Twitter. And I think that although it could be a hit, I think people are still missing what they wanted. And that was to have a separate platform uh, to exist in multiple places. And Threads is very closely intertwined with Instagram. And maybe they have a different persona that they project on, on Instagram that they want to maintain. And so that's one of the distinct challenges of Threads. I think it's very undersaturated. I think it's very quiet in comparison to a lot of other platforms because of that. Blue Sky is another one. As soon as I heard it was coming out, people got me an invitation to it. I established my same username there, but I haven't used it, A, because I don't need another platform at this moment, and B, I don't know of any of my other colleagues or prospective clients or anything along those lines who are using that as a primary thing. But I think it's important to lay your claim where you think you may need to be so at least you got a foot in the door and don't waste a lot of time until it becomes obvious that that's a place to be. And who knows, maybe another pandemic will happen and another social media will go completely viral. Hopefully, Hopefully not. No. Hopefully not. But that is the case of TikTok. That's why it went big. It's because... You did not hear that first here in this session. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's why TikTok went big. It's because they wanted that short form entertainment. They wanted to be engaged somewhere. And TikTok filled that specific niche. And there were platforms like TikTok before. I don't know if we remember Vine, but Vine used to exist and it was almost identical. So the only difference is something happened in the international community in a much larger scale that forced people into a space. And just in spite, of my mock horror, of in spite of my mock horror, you're making a great point. You always <laughs> want to think ahead and you want to keep your options open. Right. All right. Seeing no other comments, I will keep moving. I wanted to briefly identify that this particular bill that we were talking about, SB 1583, regarding diversity in Oregon, did pass our committee hearings four to three. And the reason I wanted to identify that is because what people said and what people showed up with really mattered. I was able to access the public record and see the comments that people had made and it's really important that when you're trying to get students to act, when you're trying to get people to write to their legislators, uh, to see that impact in real life. For SB 1583, someone who opposed, this is again all public record, this information is available on the Oregon Legislative website. Um, I redacted the names, I don't want to share that information, but you can find this information. 
and it says who it went to, the committee, what measure they were talking about, and what they said. And all they said was, I oppose. They didn't provide a whole lot of information. And a vast majority of the opposers had just sent this in, and that's all they said. And the vast majority of individuals who supported had provided a much more in-depth response. They provided who they are, which is really important, where they're writing from, which is really important, why this is important to them. Sometimes they provide data. They're able to use examples. They're able to pull from experiences. They make it personal. And I think that's really important. Templates help frame this conversation. Uh, it's important to have templates available for individuals to pull from and kind of write their own uh, response to who they're sending it to. Um, but at the same time, the personalization of it is what motivates government officials. And one of the biggest complaints we hear is, my voice won't matter, no one will read this. But government officials have designated staff members to tally issues and read testimonies. And it does make an impact. What you say and how personal it is and how much it means to you does matter. So when you're trying to motivate people to speak out on issues, put emphasis on the personalization. Make it about you, about your community, because it makes it a lot harder to ignore. I just wanted to point out, and that's really well said, Sarah, uh, you, you, you notice that it's in Oregon. So one of the things to remember about the iSchool is that we're a national uh, EDU. Uh, we have uh, over 300 students in Oregon alone, which basically means we are the we have the majority again of students and alums in LIS in Oregon. Uh, and so we have a role and responsibility to play to support Oregon when they need us. Um, and I wanted to emphasize that because for everyone that's listening or for everyone that's here, if you uh, help uh, nurture an advocate understand that you are you may be nurturing an advocate that is in another state and that is working with us but it's still uh helping the field in tremendous ways so there's a question hi it's me it's sam um not so much a question just kind of wanted to add to where you said like people say they don't think they can make a difference people say and then of course great to make it a personal story um I can't cite this because I'm pretty sure I saw it on a TikTok or Instagram or something, but there was a survey done where they said, like, how many times do you think you need to contact your representative or how many people do you think need to contact your representative to make a difference? And everyone was saying like, oh, hundreds, thousands of people. And the number that the representatives actually said was 40. So as long as you can get 40 people in your community to contact the representative, that is like the threshold of like, hmm this is something we should be paying attention to. So it's a lot smaller than most people think. Um, so yeah, I mean, small voices matter because they get loud when they're collective. So I just wanted to, that random, probably not a real factoid, but thing I saw online that I like to believe uh, with that. <laughs> I'm sure it's also proportional because there yeah. are, of course, smaller districts, larger districts. Um, and I think that I mean, it's still interesting data. It's really interesting seeing what is it that will motivate a congressman or motivate a representative? What is it that's going to push them to make legislation? If it's just 40 people, that's probably loud enough that they're like, wow, this is an actual issue people care about. If we get louder than that, then they know it impacts the community and they know that there are a lot of people who care. Uh, and I think, again, emphasizing what you say is really important. Like if you're calling your representative every day and just being like, I disagree with this and then hang up. You're just a little tally. But if you explain to them why or who you are, you're a person that they actually have to care about. And I think that that distinction is also really important. And to the point that Sam made, we had Patrick Sweeney on it for our January 2024 Ursula Meyer session. And again, to make the point that you can see these things on the YouTube channel CLA has. But Patrick made the point, as Sam did, that small numbers really make a difference. It doesn't take a majority of voters out there to get the attention of legislators and to have an impact. I think, if I remember correctly, you said if you've got about 3% of your community, of your voters out there raising an issue, you're getting attention. It doesn't start with 51% of them raising an issue and getting attention. Yeah, and even looking at the stats for this particular bill, a majority of the individuals who wrote in and called in and showed up 
opposed the bill and yet it still passed out of committee. And that kind of is a testament to people's power with the word and the power of enabling one another and being a part of that collective voice and kind of, it takes one person to start a chant, but it takes hundreds of people to be a chorus of voices. So I think identifying that as a motivator and the power of those numbers is really important. I also wanted to add, um, Sam, that's a great point about the 40. So certainly um, when you call, for example, the office will create a tally. And so I think 40 is a really good good uh, number to benchmark. However, what we've also found is it could just be one as well. So I think at a, at a national and local level, uh, oftentimes it's finding the right one person to talk to the legislator to make that phone call. Uh, that also uh, can be very impactful. And then the last thought is typically, um, especially for the national legislators, uh, if you meet with a staffer, they actually have to create a memo to the uh, member of Congress. And so so just, just get, having a meeting, uh, even if it's with a staffer, is, the return on investment is pretty high. And then also the last thing I would say is that at the state level, typically you very often will meet with the legislator um, uh, if, if you do set up a meeting, so, and, and actually the last thing I would say is constituency matters too, right? So, uh, they are going to listen, uh, to the voters that voted them in or can vote them out. Uh, and so that would be the other thing is that not all 40 are created equal, Sam, it is, uh, legislators that vote for that particular legislator, uh, that is the most important. And by the way, that is a question that's always asked over time whenever you visit a legislator. Is anybody here from my uh, my district? So, Especially in primary season, little tidbit. If you look at primary season and they're up against their opponent within their same party, there's a lot of tension there. And they would, that they ride on those kinds of uh, publicity. And primaries are really important. All right, moving on to a project that we have in progress. This got on our radar last week or last time we met, which is AB 535. Um, this one I feel like is really important to everybody in the room because it reserves funding for public libraries. Uh, our goal with this one is we're going to be motivating voters to write to budget subcommittees to reserve money uh, in the state budget specifically for libraries. Uh, last year when we did a similar project, uh, we got the data back for that and we had nearly 300 individuals email congr their congressman in one day. So we're hoping if we can be noisier, if we can be louder about that, we can get even more people uh, writing to their congressman. Uh, so what can you do right now? about this particular bill. Oh, look, a tiny URL, who put that there? Uh, <laughs> I tried to create this easy for you, this link, which uh, we can drop into the chat, um, will help you make noise for this specific bill. Um, it's going to take you to this page, which is our SJSU Library Advocacy page, and it has hyperlinks, it has information, it has ways to contact your legislator and make it as easy as possible. There's one, two, three, four steps. You just follow the steps and you can accomplish what needs to be accomplished to be noisy about this particular project. There will be more coming out for this uh, eventually. We did just pick it up, but I wanted to make sure to plug it here. Um, Another thing that's happening this week that you may or may not be aware of is that it's National Library Week. Um, this is direct from the American Library Association's website and their kind of step-by-step -step plan of what you can do to support them and to support libraries all across the nation. Um, just to briefly go through it, visit your libraries. Walking in the door does help. Get a library card, engage with and follow on social media learn about and read challenged books and register to vote. And this helps them uh, raise funding. Um, we can see another example of what art looks like. It's simple, it's bright, it's clean, it has information on it. Here's some more simple, bright, clean information. Uh, these are actually built for two completely different social media platforms. You have a Facebook banner, it's wider, it has bright colors, and then you have a Instagram tile. It has information, it has the hashtag on how to engage, and it's simple, it's clean. 
So we're able to see these examples when we craft things for social media. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about some challenges that we have as student advocates and just in general with advocacy. When I think of advocacy, I think of this meme from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. If you're not familiar, it's a comedy show about cops and uh, main character Jacob Peralta is going to be He's trying to go invisible. He's trying to make sure nobody sees him. And so when they ask, are you sure you won't be spotted? Jake says, absolutely. My cover makes me invisible. Excuse me, ma'am. Do you have two minutes to talk about the environment? Nailed it. Now no one will make eye contact with me. It's because this isn't how people like to be engaged with. People don't want this kind of interaction. It works, but it also makes people uncomfortable. So you have to find ways to reach them uh, and to connect with them and the way people want to receive this information. And it's always gonna have its challenges. So I wanted to talk briefly about our personal challenges and the challenges that we've had. Um, for number three, we'll start from the right and go left. It's easier for me. Uh, effort. It, you are constantly competing for other people's energy. You are constantly competing for people's time and effort. You need to make sure that what you are talking about is worthy of that time. You might think so. You need to call to them what makes it worth their time to them and meet them on that field. Complexity, you wanna make it easy. You wanna make sure you are addressing something that they can actually walk away with steps. They can have a one, two, three, this is the best way to accomplish that task. Uh, less steps is always easier. Less steps is definitely better. But people, again, like checklists. They like to be able to say, I did that thing and I can move on. And again, emphasis on power of numbers. Uh, there's always a few people who are like, my voice doesn't matter. Or uh, this is really overwhelming and I don't want to be involved. The power of numbers and getting more people involved and just having one person speak on an issue is an accomplishment and acknowledge that accomplishment. Uh, one tactic that Dr. Chow likes to utilize and we would like to utilize moving forwards is addressing uh, different people in different states. So SJSU, the State University is located here in Northern California, but we have students enrolled in nearly every other state. By targeting specific states and saying, hey, Texas, somebody from your state at, who's also an SJSU student, hasn't emailed their Congress, uh, can you please do that? They go, whoa, I'm from Texas. And so they're able to uh, engage with that on a more personal level. You're calling people out specifically, you're making it personal. That makes it less effort, that makes it less complex, and it makes it part of their voice. And then just kind of my final thought to wrap up on that is, uh, kind of that idea that democracy relies on free information and facts and truth. Um, remind people to double check sources, to engage with social media, to connect with other people and meet people where they dwell, meet the standards where they are, address the communities of what they need. And usually they know what they need and they're willing to talk about it. They just need help getting that voice. I think that wraps up my presentation. Uh, we're just getting started here. <laughs> great, great job, Sarah. Uh, Paul, so you want to make a comment? So, to absorb this, please. So, I just wanted to mention um, <clears throat> for AB five thirty five, uh, I, I believe that is focused more on school libraries, Sarah. Uh, but with that being said, I just wanted to reemphasize that school libraries in, in California uh, were were last uh, in terms of supporting school libraries, and the reason why it's important is because when you think about uh, where uh, members of the public learn about the value of libraries, one of them is in, in, in schools. And so, um, and then on top of that, the other part to it is certainly the fact that, uh, and no surprise, but we're in always in the uh, mid to upper 40s in terms of literacy rates across the country. And many of the children uh, that uh, school libraries are serving are ones that do not have a lot of books at home, do not have a lot of disposable income, and also do not have parents that have the time to take them to the public library. So I think uh, as we continue to fight that fight, Paul and, and others, uh, it, is a, it is a library fight 
uh, for the uh, for the benefit in particular of the children that uh, attend our schools. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And yes, there's a lot of exciting things that are happening. Uh, and you've heard it here first. Uh, one of them is that we are looking to put supportive school libraries on the ballot in two years. Uh, because we are uh, we are tired of of trying to advocate within the formal structure ball, and we're just going to take it to the voters. Uh, and similar to how the arts did last year, we think that may have may be the best chance of success. Of just asking the voters to fund school libraries, um, and and, uh, and 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 of course try many different ways, but that's one of the ways we're going to do it. Anyway, I'll stop there, Sarah. Great job, uh, so proud of you. Anthony, looking forward to supporting that effort you just talked about of getting the school libraries more support. Tom, Jerry, Sam, and Jessica, any questions or comments? I thought that was a great presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Um, when I was in, uh, when I was at UCR for my undergrad, I can't tell you how many times I, you know, fake picked up a phone call when somebody would try to hand me a flyer or something. So yeah, I think you you hit that on the head. And I think that's one of the things I'm trying to <clears throat> work on myself is building those relationships. And um, like you said, Anthony, just just trying to get out there. Um, it's kind of a little hard for me. I'm like, I'm a little shy, honestly. But um, yeah, that's one of the things I'll work on. And, yeah. I'm I'm definitely the kind of person that when I see advocates like on the on the street, if it's petitions, I ask them first. I say, what am I signing? I want to know. But if it's like someone handing a flyer or somebody asking for money, I'm usually the kind of person where I'll like turn to who I'm with and be like, ask me a really complicated question right now. So I don't have to engage with this person. And I totally understand that. It really depends on the case by case scenario. And I think that's why social media is such a good tool. It's because people who want that information are actively looking for it. And those are the people you want to motivate anyways, right? Um, it helps to have that front to front person to person interaction. You definitely get more motivation, but you're also getting a lot more people walking away. And I and also wanted to build on Jerry, your your point as well in terms of being shy. I think um, I'm actually in the same boat. So as a system professor, I've, I've, I've always, I'm, I'm more of an introvert, but the reason why I've kind of cast that aside, Jerry, is for the benefit of the people that we serve. So when we talk about children, we talk about people in need, um, the question to ask yourself, are you willing to fight for them? Are you willing to be embarrassed? Are you willing to put yourself in embarrassing situations for people that don't have a voice? I think um, that would be what I would encourage you to do is, is kind of look at it as you have a chance to fight for somebody else. Are you willing to do it? And I do think that is part of the challenge of being an advocate is, yes, you will find yourself being embarrassed at times. You'll be finding yourself uh, advocating for things that you may not be completely prepared to talk about, but you're still out there supporting the people that you serve. And so that's that's how I would uh, encourage you to, to to look at it is yes, we I mean most of us in our field in this field are pretty more on the introverted side, but if you got to fight for somebody else, I'm quite sure Jerry you'll do it. And that and I think that's really the heart of advocacy is uh giving other people a voice. Yeah, right on. Thank you. I see a raised hand. Go ahead, Jessica. Um, I was just going to go back to the point. Now I can do audio. <laughs> um, um, of taking the issue directly to the voters on funding public schools. This has been my battle for, um, I've been actually in this position for six years. And when I arrived, there was uh, all the schools in my district were struggling. Everything was behind and nobody has up-to-date collections. Um, the thing that made a difference for my school was getting the parents involved. So going back to the Friends of the Library group that we created here, um, and I, what I found is nobody, not a lot of people are going to say they're not interested in helping libraries if they know libraries need the help. And so when you put the question directly to people, they they come through. So I'm seeing that in a very small sort of way in my my school community. Um, and where we don't have funding from the district um, for any of our libraries, um, we've created it on site, but now we're creating a stir. So for the first time, our district has put out, um, um, uh, they, they sent out a, a survey to all the librarians asking what we need and what we could do to create a, um, a program that 
is from the district and we, we don't have a funding model, but for the first time ever, they're talking about it. And I think that's because the parents that we pulled together on my campus have been going to the superintendent and talking um, and, and people are raising their voices about what matters. And so, um, like I said, I've been able to turn this library our library around in the last couple of years just by getting people to pay attention to it. So I think that, you know, the 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 grassroots voices are what makes a difference for sure. Well, let's make sure we keep in touch, Jessica and Paul, I guess, and Sarah, that's something else that we could do is as we're building this, um, our magic number uh, right now is about three million in fundraising. Um, in other words, we recognize the fact that, and I and I have to say, my first job in college was as a uh, as one of those people that got people to sign voters registration forms on the clipboard. But we have to hire people like that, and we also have to have commercials, and we have to do a lot of other things to get ready to rumble. So I think uh, let's definitely uh, start gathering names, Jessica. Uh, as uh, and we're not asking you to contribute, but I'm saying with the big boys in particular, we need them to come out and support this initiative. So yeah, let's do it together. Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do it. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm running around. I always tell people I'm in library school, so I'm the biggest cheerleader ever, but, um, but it never dies. I I'm never not excited. And, um, you know, I'm, I always say I'm a, a reluctant leader. <laughs> I'll step in when it needs to happen. So, <laughs> well, you know, the, the best thing, Jessica is, is if you look at anyone that is doing really, really well, uh, I almost guarantee they're they're power users of libraries or were power users of libraries uh, because yeah so I think I think it, that definitely the support is there we just have to work together to galvanize yeah, absolutely you just have to put it to people and they will go of course of course I support libraries mm -hmm. you just have to let them know that it the urgency that's there mm -hmm. that parents are an excellent solution. resource yeah uh, they've been. The, it has been just absolutely incredible. I went from zero, I mean, this is small potatoes, but it's an elementary school library. So we went from zero dollars of funding to $15,000 in funding annually, uh, just out of parent support. And so that's just been incredible for us. So. so we are almost out of time. Those of you on the live call, if you want to hang, once we end the recording, we can have a little post session continuation if you still have unanswered questions. Last thing I want to make sure we include on this is the all important question for you and for anybody else watching this. What are you going to do differently in the next week because you were part of this conversation? Nothing. Nobody's going to do anything differently. Well, I'm definitely going to contact our principal at <laughs> my kid's school. So, um, I mean, I had been already. Um, yeah, I, I had been very involved in my school in the PTA and raising funds because, um, you know, and I was able to, um, when I started, the, I, I'm the fundraising chair there and I was able to, and we are a title one school. So um, I implemented new fundraising uh, systems and we went from like, I think the prior year, cause it's pandemic, we think we made 15,000 to when we filed our taxes last year, we had $60,000 in fundraising. So, um, but now that, you know, this past the big funders that we had, which is a readathon, actually, um, we allocated some money from the library. But now, with the information that you have, you know, shared with me, I'm going to um, schedule a meeting with the principal and, you know, ask to see, you know, how many books per student. Because I know a lot of the books that we get sometimes just go to the classrooms and not necessarily a library. So, um, just all those things that I'm actually very interested in. Um, seeing what they do. So um, I don't I don't have a library degree. I actually um, I have an MPA and I had a focus on fundraising and nonprofit management. So but it still kind of ties in here. And I you used to be a Sarah? board member. I used to be a library board member for a city of Ontario before I started working as a um, friend of library liaison. So. So and I, and I would say definitely we need to get your contact information <laughs> as well. Okay. Um, but the other thing, I would, a question I have is, do you have a certified school librarian overseeing your school? Librarian? I actually don't think she's a, I think she's a, a paraprofessional. I don't think she's a librarian. Okay. Yeah. But I'm so not I, sure. Yeah. So I would suggest that you, uh, I know it's a longer term goal, but I would suggest you fight for that. Because again, in the end, the certified uh, librarians are trained to be very strategic mm -hmm. and to also be developing that, uh, curating 
a, yeah. a culturally relevant collection, which takes a lot of work, right? It's yeah. not something, and, and I, I think the key that people don't realize sometimes is it's not just about books. It's about the types of books yeah. or types of resources that best meet the needs of your children, right? And that takes yeah. a lot of work and it, and it needs to be very strategic, so. Right. Anne is going to take it to her PTA. You know, Jessica was talking about what she's going to do with this. Tom in chat has said, wasn't certain if this would apply to his friends group, but he's going to share the very good ideas presented here. I'm going to remind you to anybody, feel free to share the archived version of this, part or all of it, with people who might benefit from it so that this continues to have the impact that we're already seeing it now. Quick summary so that you don't walk away going, I can't remember anything that was said here. We heard Sarah talk so wonderfully about the importance of being part of that movement out there. You don't need large numbers to start. You just need to be part of that voice. Use social media effectively, which means targeting it to the audiences and the platform themselves. Heard about the importance of, of getting people from all over the country involved through the network you have, including the San Jose State University Network, California Library Association Network, and other groups that are part of this. So we hope this was, has been a benefit to you we hope you will come back to another one very soon. Again, second Wednesday of each month, usually starting at 10 a.m. Pacific time. There's a whole archive of well over 24 of these sessions now on the California Library Association YouTube channel. We would appreciate your help in making that resource available to others because it's underutilized now. We want to make sure that it is utilized to the max. With that, thank you, Sarah, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, Anthony, as always, for being just a wonderful collaborator. And we'll see you again next month. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Nice job, Sarah. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.